All right, my timer says 50 minutes. Can everybody hear me okay? Let's get started. Thanks for coming along. Uh, my name's Derek, and I'll be your talker this afternoon. And uh, this afternoon, we're talking about streaming data platforms and closure. Uh, I run a, a little consultancy in Melbourne, Australia. That was me. I brought the weather with me last weekend, so you're all very welcome. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll heat up again by about August. So, um, And we do this sort of stuff that I'm going to talk about today for a bunch of clients. Uh, just a couple of quick questions to start. How many people are familiar with closure? Everybody. everybody. Great. How many people use it day to day? Okay, yeah, a handful of people. Does anyone know what a streaming data platform is? One or two. There's a few marketing departments at the moment that will sell you one if you want to buy one. Um, I'm going to try and describe streaming data platforms, not so much in terms of frameworks, but more in terms of constraints and characteristics. And then talk a little bit about some real-world architecture that we, um, we have uh, delivered as a little team in, the, in this year. So um, what is a streaming data platform? I know my team build them because it says so on our website. Um, come in, come in. Uh, and I know what we do. Basically, we're lumberjacks, right? We wear a lot of flannel. Um, we work with logs all day, and um, often we can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, basically, we've been solving different problems with the same approach for years, and that is building materialized views from an immutable append-only log, which is one particular architectural style that is very well suited to scale, high availability, reliability. Um, and in my personal opinion, I think Clojure is the absolute bee's knees for this sort of problem, uh, when broadly speaking, um, you're talking about building systems that ingest data, transform data, retain data, and return data at some point. Um, Clojure is just at this really sweet nexus of being able to leverage the JVM and all of the fine libraries that come along with it, and also being able to shed an enormous amount of cognitive load, things that I just don't really have to worry about anymore, object modeling. Uh, object hierarchies. So I'm going to um, take you through a bit of a journey with that today and uh, do some live coding as well. So one problem with the sort of trap that I've fallen into is that if all you have is a chainsaw, everything starts to look like a problem that can be solved with a commit log. Uh, I, we have clients, very clever clients, who are building systems that um, model traditional transactional RPC style systems at very low latency with the sort of architectural stacks that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, we are going to limit it to the simpler problem domain of computing, deriving, and aggregating facts from a constant stream of events, the log, in an elastic, resilient way. So really, it's about indexing a stream. Right? It's about taking your initial font of data providing more complex semantics for ac accessing that data by repartitioning it, transforming it, retaining it, and recalling it from your stream as required. Um, when the slides run out, I'm going to start the uh, performance art part of the talk, which, um, if it works, it's perfectly intentional. If it's a complete train wreck, uh, all art has value, so your lives are going to be enriched this afternoon. Um, if you enjoy the talk, the whole, the whole point of this talk is to encourage you to play and have fun, right? Um, if you enjoy uh, the talk, if any of this makes any sense to you, I'd really encourage you to have a look at this repository, reproduce what we've done, have a play for yourself. Literally nothing beats playing in the REPL for learning about the sort of systems that uh, I work with. And the sort of systems, the distributed systems we work with, have lots of pointy edges. So uh, really, you just need to get in there and play with it and figure out different techniques for partitioning and domain models and so on. So speaking of um, playing and learning, I know this is going to be very difficult for some of you to believe, given my fresh-faced visage, but I'm actually a child of the 80s. And that means um, first computers with rubber keyboards Yes, I hear little cries of delight over there. It's going to get even better in a second. First computers means 
First, computer games. Chucky Egg. It's just an absolute delight. Um, this used to load from a cassette tape. That's how hipster I am. First, computer games means first, computer game loading screens. If you're old enough, you can actually hear this image. The, sort of <laughs> the clicking and the whirring. I actually, I got a. It's on YouTube if you fa fancy a bit of deeper nostalgia. Um, yeah, Chucky Egg was marvelous. And anyway, to get to this loading screen as a six year old mini Derek, um, you had to get through your first REPL. So, um, if you wanted to play games on the Spectrum 48K, you had to type some Sinclair Basic into the interpreter to spark the computer to life. And that's how I became a programmer, basically. That's why I'm standing here today, copying my big brother um, without really understanding it. So how many people are familiar with REPLs, use REPLs in any, any sort of language? Yep, quite a few. Does anyone use the, um, the Java REPL regularly? No one? I just, I'm not quite sure the language is really suited to it, but I, I have to admit I did play with it online last week, and it's kind of, yeah, you know, fun enough for having a bit of a play. I'm not sure it would ever become a part of my workflow if I was trying to build solutions in Java, but I appreciate the, you know, the effort to pull the, the language in that direction. Um, and some of you might have figured out this isn't actually a REPL, it's an interactive prompt, um, but it was, you know, it was the 80s, it was close enough. So, uh, I would like to draw your attention to this very scientific graph. This is um, my enjoyment of programming over time. You can see a strong peak at the start where I discovered the Sinclair. And then, you know, I unfortunately got a job um, in the predominant language of the day, which was Java, which is a fine language. I love it. I don't work with it so often these days. It's not really anything about the language that sort of caused me to pitfall there. Uh, it's just the rigmarole of working for a living, the eternal humiliation of it. Um, so, but what has happened, this strong uptick, is that um, closure entered my life. And I, you know, I really think if you want to have a long career in programming, if you really enjoy it, you're going to have to find a way to enjoy yourself. And my reflection on working with closure for nearly five years now, it's lots of fun. A terribly smart chap called Rich Hickey out there. I met him at the Closure Conge last year, and um, he told me a secret. Sorry about this, Richard. But um, basically, Closure is just Java, right? With some extra bits. You move some symbols around a little bit, put some parentheses in there. Don't worry about all the functional stuff. We're going to get you all to be Closure programmers if you're not already by the end of this talk, because you're going to want to play in that REPL, right? We're going to do some cool stuff at the end of the talk if I don't run off the edge of a cliff. I've only got 42 minutes left. Um, so what is a streaming data platform? Back to the question at hand. Um, we're here to talk about real world architectures. So let's start with some real world problems. Our clients generate lots of data, not Netflix lots, not Google lots. I'm talking about um, telecommunications companies. Uh, I've forgotten who my clients are now. Uh, Utility companies that own power lines, some gambling companies, uh, startups, payment providers. Uh, so really what they're doing, um, it doesn't really matter how that stream of data is generated, whether it's electricity meters or payment networks or email servers. Someone somewhere is doing something useful and as a byproduct, they're uh, generating an enormous amount of data in log format. So capturing and interpreting that data has real value to all sorts of enterprises. Um, it can drive new products, internal insights, change behaviors, avert failures. In this talk, we're going to describe a platform that computes over an immutable stream of facts, deriving and aggregating new facts, putting everything somewhere suitable, and finally retrieving them on demand. We begin with a log, we end with a log, we just prov provide richer semantics for accessing that log in time. So I'm going to start by attempting to define the characteristics, constraints, and concerns of a streaming data platform without naming any brands. So this is the sort of system 
that we've been building over the last few years. We ingest, transform, retain, and retrieve. These are the characteristics of data-oriented systems. Our focus uh, is on data locality, immutability, item potence, replayability, and parallelism, linear scalability, uh, rather than mutability, encapsulation, domain modeling, object hierarchies, all of the sorts of things that I used to do when I worked in London for all of those years. Uh, it might be possible to process your initial immutable time series without ever creating a, a traditional object model for it, simply by identifying the attributes that you want to query by, transforming your data into a suitable shape, retaining it, and providing the means to retrieve it. A change to the shape of your data, and if that's the one thing about all of the projects that I've ever worked on, they're always dynamic. The context, that state machine that's creating these logs always changes. Um, when that data changes, it need not trigger an existential crisis in the correctness of your previous domain modeling efforts. Maybe you just require a little tweak in your library of functions that interpret that data. Uh, when my team work in this space, we deliberately stay as close as possible to the data. We shed that cognitive load that isn't core to the task at hand. And we build strategies for dealing with the stream as it changes over time. I don't know if anyone saw Rich Hickey's um, keynote at the last Closure Conge, I think it was, maybe prior to that, where he talked about always owning your own failures, basically. Systems that only ever accrete um, functionality uh, and never making any breaking changes. It's hard, I wouldn't say. There are always um, exceptions, but yeah, we can, we can aim for these sorts of systems. Um, so we could perhaps support versioning of the stream of data coming in uh, as an inexorable accretion of functions in our library of data transformation over time. We ingest data, transform it, retain it, then retrieve it. It's a simplified version of my uh, entire career. So what are the constraints of the sorts of streaming data platforms that we work on? Well, uh, it has to be highly available. A failure to ingest data might cause cascading errors through clients with high throughput and limited local resources. A failure to compute might impact the enterprise's ability to operate real-time threat detection, perhaps. A failure to retain could similarly cause awkward back pressure problems, um, or even long-term data durability concerns. So we require elasticity. If our um, clients all share one thing, they all intend on being horribly successful, which means more data, which means they want to be able to scale their systems. The case study we're going to touch on shortly um, was originally implemented in 2014 and has scaled two orders of magnitude um, and been migrated from on-prem into the cloud. Uh, and without any real fundamental changes to the architecture, it's linearly scalable frameworks that underpin the sorts of systems that we build. Durability is required where we expect to access the interpretation of the original stream over a period of years. So if you're building an archive, you might need seven years or six years of data retention. GDPR, I'm not going to talk about today. Um, and uh, we don't, what we don't ever want to do uh, is recompute our indexes unless it's absolutely necessary. We want a database for our data at rest for our source of truth. Uh, so those, that's the sort of characteristics and constraints of the sorts of systems that we build, what I call streaming data platforms. Um, and what are the concerns of these? Well, there are exceptions in every case, as always, but when we're working with log data, we favor the following wherever possible. Immutability. So at a system level, I suppose the universe is a an immutable sequence of facts. Uh, if your system is very write-heavy and read-light, which would be probably a fairly normal thing for a log processing uh, platform, then it might be a suitable paradigm to treat 
mutating states as a sequence of new facts rather than actually changing anything and just resolve on read time, possibly might be a suitable thing to do. At a language level, Clojure provides um, persistent data structures which are effectively immutable. Um, so it's basically impossible for another thread or another actor to manipulate your data under your, under your nose, which is great when you're executing in parallel. And lots of things are much safer about the language. And I'm not uh, smart enough really to unify a single abstraction of all the ways that immutability can simplify your life. But I've heard it said um, that you should let immutability guide you. And uh, let's just go with that. Anyone who's read um, Josh Block's Effective Java knows, you know, immutability is in there as well. It's just harder to achieve in a language that is, um, that is geared towards mutable structures. Idempotence is always a concern when we build these streaming compute systems um, because what happens when the wheels fall off? Well, we turn it off and we turn it on again, basically. Our first failure mode is to just reprocess the log. Um, so you should always try and make sure you end up in a situation that you can freely recompute from the back of the queue without any unintended consequences. Uh, flexibility, we work with distributed systems that often have much sharper edges than uh, traditional databases. They're less forgiving, they don't support joins, for instance, with, with Cassandra. Uh, it's easy to build a data model that requires a data migration at some point in the future to uh, support a requirement that you've missed. So some very simple advice, don't pre-compute your views. Store the simplest, fullest index of the original stream that you can, and keep it for as long as you can. And for the um, message broker that we use, Kafka, you'll hear a lot of advice that you potentially should just never expire your data in Kafka. That could be a smart thing to do. Um, always think of your read paths first and build data models that support one, more than one mode of access if your underlying distributed database supports that and you can facilitate it. So go easy on future Derek, basically, is my advice. No one wants to export and import 40 terabytes of data. Um, and locality. So understand how your data sits at rest. You have to really understand the distributed systems that you're going to use if you're going to be processing lots and lots of logs. Um, optimize that locality for your read paths while understanding the operational requirements of your source of truth. So in uh, Cassandra, for example, it's very easy to create very, very large partitions in a data model that might not look like a pathological problem at the time, but that leads to uh, a lot of GC overhead when you're compacting, can do. That in turn causes the cluster to think that nodes are dropping in and out of the cluster. So, um, yeah, we need to think about how our data sits at rest and the operational impacts of that as well. So, let's take a quick look at a real-world case study. One of our clients is a messaging company, and their servers receive thousands of requests per second. Processing those um, generates an event log, which we then digest. And the aim of the platform is to provide a range of services to the client. We want to compute over that stream for real-time threat detection. We want to enable a multi-year historical search tool for customer services representatives so I can come and see what's happening to those messages over time. Um, we want to be able to generate precise reports with exact counts, perhaps for billing purposes, nothing fuzzy at all, which can be hard to do in a streaming sense. Um, and we're happy with fuzzier figures for analytical uh, reasons. We built and evolved the system over years uh, with the technology stacks that I'm about to describe. More recently, we um, completed a project to launch this entire platform in Azure, moving from on-premises, with the target goal of a complete platform launch in a region um, within about 30 minutes. And that takes a lot of orchestration and automation. It took a lot of effort for us to change our processes and our approach to software as well. Um, and the system, uh, yeah, processes billions of events a month, which is just a useless figure to throw out there, really. Quite a lot of data. Probably any normal enterprise could generate that sort of stuff if they wanted to. So um, let's look at the 
5,000 foot view. This is uh, a streaming data platform that runs in the cloud. It's got some stuff in here. It's got Cassandra and Zookeeper and Kafka that are all running in Docker containers. Um, it's got Kubernetes managing stateless services. There's a whole bunch of them. We weren't brave enough to try and run our stateful uh, Kafka and Cassandra nodes inside Kubernetes. We just were a very small team. We didn't have the brain power to do that. And that's sort of right at the cusp at the moment of starting to happen. So hopefully we can leverage some of the good work in, uh, in, in the open source world. Maybe the next time we do this project, it might be a bit different. Um, and we've got some storage and container registry stuff. We've got some Bastion nodes, load balancers. Uh, we, we actually um, initialize and run everything out of a little Docker container called the cockpit, which you can just run a couple of simple commands, and you can get one of these up and running in no time at all. Uh, and uh, it can be hard to reckon with systems like this as a programmer. I think, how do I play with that? Uh, I really don't have a clue. Like, I guess I could spin it up in, in the cloud and start hacking away at it, but I don't really have any fine-grained fidelity or control over it. It's just a remote system that's operating under its own power probably has things that may happen to it that are outside of my control. It feels a bit like there's a Carl Sagan quote where he says, if um, you want to bake an apple pie from scratch, first you must create the universe. And I feel a little bit today like programming can feel a bit like that sometimes because beyond this, we've got Terraform for declarative infrastructure. Um, we've got a bunch of other stuff in there, Packer for OS imaging and things like that. Um, and we haven't even really talked about the bit where we process a log yet, where we actually do the thing that the application is supposed to do. Uh, so one approach that we use in my little company is we strip as much of that away as possible. We don't do any of this when we're actually developing systems. Um, no Docker, no Minikube, just don't do it. This is a, a sort of an off-channel productionizing of the platform after we've got the basics of it right. Uh, so what we do, we try and shrink this surface area down to a small enough size that we can fit it in a thimble, and we take that thimble and we put it in a single JVM and we operate it all out of a REPL using Clojure. So this is the core of our platform. We ingest data into Kafka. We transform it in Kafka streams, uh, which are almost or always exclusively Clojure implementations. Um, of a Kafka Streams topology. We retain that data in Cassandra, and then we retrieve it again via uh, one or two different Clojure web services. They might be microservices, I don't really know. They're not very big. Um, this is the thing that we want to be able to play with, right? We want to be able to get this, get real great control of it, like we're banging on those rubber keys on a Spectrum 48K. We want to be able to see our failures. We want to be able to put data in and pull data out learn about the impacts of partitioning in Kafka or data models in Cassandra, um, change things, play with it, and see what the impact that that has. Uh, so, just very briefly, what is Kafka? Well, it's great for log data. What is, it, um, what is it really? It's a partitioned, immutable, distributed commit log, which is a bit of a mouthful. It offers very simple read and write semantics. I'm sure if you've been here for two days, you've probably seen about six Kafka talks. You throw a rock in the air at DevOps at the moment, you're gonna hit someone talking about Kafka, which is not an invitation, by the way, it's just an observation. Um, producers send messages to topics, uh, which are individual logs. The topics exist on Kafka servers, which are known as brokers, so you can see these little brokers down here. Uh, consumers read the topic data from brokers, and topics are broken up into partitions. So in this little squiggly diagram that I threw together, we have one topic with three partitions distributed across three brokers. Uh, each partition has a replication factor, in this case, two. Uh, that determines the number of copies you have of your data. Uh, for each replicated partition, only one partition is the leader. Uh, one broker, sorry for that, partition is the leader. And it's the leader of uh, a partition that all of the producers and consumers talk to. 
and interact with. There are uh, much better, much deeper technical descriptions available to you, so let's try something a little bit different. If Kafka were a cake, what sort of cake would Kafka be? It's very obvious. I'm very pleased with myself. Kafka would be a Battenberg cake. Uh, it's constructed of simple parts. It's entirely manageable in one sitting. It pleases everyone. It's very important to get those partitions right and to really use them. Semantic partitioning is very, very powerful at an application level. And actually, it powers a lot of the um, Kafka Streams API that I'll basically just skip over a bit later on. Um, it's important to get your partitions right, as beautiful as a Mondrian can be. It's probably not what you're looking for. You need to make sure those partitions are balanced. That's that understanding the data locality of the systems that you're building. Um, what have been our problems with Kafka over the last nearly four years of running it in production? Um, on, without going into the Kafka stream side of things, we used to use a, a distributed computation framework called Storm, which we have dropped entirely for just using Kafka streams today. But on the Kafka message broker side of things, nothing really in four years. It's very easy to run. Um, we don't operate at a massive scale. Right? That's the thing between us and our clients and Netflix that might be running thousands of nodes. These are phenomenal systems for building reasonable uh, solutions for reasonably sized clients. We might run three to five Kafka brokers. Um, you, could pro you could process billions of events with five decent Kafka brokers. The operational overhead of that is not particularly high. Uh, we have had uh, producers stop producing. We've had consumers stop consuming. Both happened probably about once a year. That's not enough of a problem for us to spend any engineering effort trying to figure out why, when, because we build um, idempotent systems that support replayability, we just turn them off and on again. So, you know, that's a very simple solution. Um, yeah, so Kafka, I'd encourage everyone to get it, have a play with it, go wild. Cassandra. Well, Cassandra is a partitioned mutable distributed commit log. It's probably a bit more than that, really, but actually at its implementation right down under the covers. It's great for log data. It uses something called um, log structured merge trees, which are a phenomenal data structure. If you want to do some reading about um, interesting stuff on that side of things. It's particularly suited to immutable time series workloads. And as I sort of touched on at the start, if you want to model anything as an immutable time series, you can just go right ahead and do that, unless my understanding of the universe is completely incorrect. Um, if you're heavily mutating data or you're deleting data out of Cassandra, you're almost inevitably doing it wrong. You shouldn't do that. If you do do that, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. And if you're in Australia, you're going to end up probably having me come in and explain that to you at some point. Wouldn't be the first time. Uh, and there's a formidable operational overhead to Cassandra. Some of the uh, there's, a, there's a vibrant community around Cassandra. A lot of people who operate Cassandra operate at a very, very big scale, which is well beyond the scope of anything we've worked at. I heard it said um, several years ago that Cassandra, uh, Apple ran about 100,000 Cassandra nodes. All your iMessages were going through it at one point. I don't know if that's still the case now. Um, general thinking seems to be if you're running a Cassandra cluster of more than about a dozen nodes or more, um, you're going to need one full-time effective staff member to basically be the DBA for that, right? You're going to have to understand all of the different knobs that you can twiddle, the ones you should never touch, and when things start to go slowly off a cliff, you can pull it back again. Um, the interesting thing about Cassandra for me is you absolutely must be thinking about your read paths when you write data into uh, into Cassandra. If you've got a domain model that is something valuable to you and your organization, and you're just going to use an ORM tool to map that into something that looks suitable in Cassandra, you're almost definitely doing it wrong. Um, the only valuable shape to put things into Cassandra is the shape that you intend to support to query it back out again. And normally, what we do is we to totally denormalize and we write a lot more data than you normally would to get around the fact that Cassandra doesn't offer joins. It's very limited. But we have Cassandra clusters with 50, 60 terabytes of data. 
We support ad hoc queries over that data. Um, I'm not sure I could do that in Postgres. Um, possibly, I think that there's some people doing interesting stuff with Postgres at that sort of volume of data these days. So if Cassandra was a cake, I don't know how this is going to work because I wasn't even aware of this type of cake before I moved to Australia. Australians are fascinated by this cake. Australian families have competitions to bake this cake every year. They're on every street corner. It is a crock and bush. It's um, complex, it's fragile, it's delightful, um, it's formidable, and it, it's really delightful if you get it right. But it's likely you're not going to get it right first time unless you've got more engineering resources than certainly I ever had. So it's important to be able to get these things into a REPL and play with it, right? It's understand the bounds of it and how you can break it and learn a, bit, a little bit about the domain model and the constraints. Learn that in a REPL in a single JVM on your machine rather than in production, please. Problems with Cassandra? Um, I've seen basically all of them. Uh, it's possible near enough to make a Cassandra cluster shake itself apart if you don't treat it right. Um, Cassandra basically needs a cup of tea and a pat on the head every night before it goes to bed, otherwise you'll end up in a whole world of pain. Uh, and I think Cassandra Calamities is probably the basis for a whole conference of talks, so we're going to skip right over that. Because you don't need to know, you can check out the GitHub repository and play with it after this. So, Clojure. Clojure is a data-oriented language that thrives on the JVM. It's mature, it's stable, it's slow-moving, and it has great Java interop. At its core is the idea of simple data structures and a library of functions that operate on those data structures, which is wonderful if your goal is, broadly speaking, to transform data. Uh, commonly, we ship Clojure, uh, Kafka streams, topologies, or microservices just as jars. You re they're indistinguishable from Java jars uh, once they've been built. So you can basically go right ahead and start cutting closure and shipping it, just don't tell anybody. It's fine. Uh, no one's ever going to know until they, maybe they might know. Um, closure is also a functional language. It's a lisp. It's homo-iconic. It's lots of other things. But personally, I find that much less interesting than what I can do with the language. It's uh, maturity and it's reliability. For me, it's an extremely effective way of working. It's brought a lot of enjoyment to my last few years of programming. Um, and Really, what Clojure is, is an exquisite window onto the JVM. It gives us that interactivity and immediacy that curious developers crave. Um, and it's fun. Now, the view from your window may vary. Um, I have seen some projects. I've been responsible for some projects myself. There's nothing Clojure can do to help you with that. Um, so. That's probably enough of the talky-talky side of things. We're going to have a play now. We're going to build a streaming data platform from scratch in the REPL uh, in under 17 minutes. I'm going to talk you through it at the same time. We are going to use a couple of open source libraries that my company provides. One is called Thimble. You might have seen that coming. That's the um, closure sandpit for playing with all of the technologies that I've mentioned. We can start Zookeeper servers. We can start Kafka brokers, Kafka consumers, um, Kafka producers, Kafka admin clients, Cassandra clusters, uh, all from the REPL. Get them back as some state. Play with them, put messages on things, read and write data, have a lot of fun. Uh, that's really for testing purposes. We use that everywhere to test everything that we do. Um, and then Archie is our wrapper around a superb um, closure library for interacting with Cassandra. It supports um, prepared statements and externalizing the configuration for those prepared statements in a format called HCQL that we came up with. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in this sort of domain or you're working with closure Cassandra, I check out Archie or any of these systems, have a look at Thimble. Um, so I'm going to have to switch my display around which should be, hopefully, relatively straightforward. And um, jump into 
a Clojure project. So I use IntelliJ to work uh, with Clojure. I know there's a lot of people who use Vim or Emacs, and certainly some of my colleagues almost feel like they've got the keyboard plugged into the back of their neck. Typing fast has never been my problem with programming. I type at a reasonable pace. Uh, it's thinking that's always been the hard bit. So this is the basis for a Clojure project. This is the project CLJ. And you can see here it defines a bunch of um, a bunch of dependencies. They're just Maven dependencies, basically. There's stuff in there. You might not recognize much of it. Logback Classic, maybe. On a production system, we'll use everything. We'll use Lucene. Um, we have a, just a whole array of Java dependencies that we use because you know, basically we're building the same systems we used to use Java for. We're just using Clojure instead. So um, the basis of this little uh, project that I've got here is I took the Enron corpus, uh, which is when those bad, naughty Enron uh, schemers back in the day in California were ripping off the state of California. Um, their, when it came to the court case, all of their emails were captured and put into the public domain, and they're available for people to use, useful little data set. It's about one and a half gig, I think. It's about 300,000 messages. I paired it right back to 100,000 messages that um, are basically uh, depersonalized. I've got a first name recipient and a, a sender, a subject. What we're going to do is we're going to process those 100,000 messages. We're going to have a look at it first. We'll play with the data in the REPL. We're going to chuck those 100,000 messages onto Kafka. We're going to process them in Kafka streams. We're going to write them into about a half a million indexes in, um, in Cassandra. And then we're going to query that data back from Cassandra two different ways. Because uh, when we write the data into Cassandra, we're going to bin it every day. We've got about two years' worth of data that we're going to write in. Uh, we're going to read a single bin, a single day, for a single person to see all of the words that they used in the subject. Um, and then we'll have a time series um, read where we basically look for a couple of years' worth of someone's, all of the individual tokens, the you know, um, tokenized string that people were sending in uh, the subject, which is something that you might want to do if you've got some data and you want to be able to perform ad hoc queries. We're not going to do anything to do with combining these queries or anything today. It's probably beyond the scope of this. But I want to give you a taste of just how easy it is to do something like that. I have 13 minutes left, which is good. I should finish about five minutes early. So um, first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to run a REPL. I'm going to get rid of that. Everybody see this OK? So um, actually, before I get rid of that, in my project, I've got a few things. I've got some resources. I have, um, I have something called HSQL, which is something that we open source in Archie. It's a way of taking the commands that you want to execute against Cassandra and externalizing them in a separate format that you can just describe in configuration. At some point, I'm going to initialize a system. And out of that system, I'm going to get a connection to Cassandra. And it's going to have these prepared statements prepared for me to be able to execute. I've got some schema. It's a very simple Cassandra schema, which is a time series that I'm going to write data into. I've got some configuration I'll come back to in a minute. I've got logback test, which is something that you might be very familiar with if you use logback. This messages JSON is 100,000 JSON log lines. And then I've got some, I've got five uh, Clojure namespaces. In Clojure, we just segregate our functions into namespaces. You can leave them all in one big namespace if you like. It's really just for context. It's for, you know, I'm a big fan of the thought of programming being a sort of a, a literary exercise. You know, you're telling a story. It's about um, providing some extra context in that story. Where's my REPL? So the first thing that we're going to do, uh, I use um, IntelliJ with a plugin called Cursive, which is an absolutely superb way of working with Clojure. It suits me perfectly. Um, it's got an interactive sort of history of the commands that you've executed in the past. And of course, I've um, run through this multiple times. So I'm going to um, read those 100,000 messages out of um, the resources directory into a little variable called messages, and I can count that. There you go, got 100,000. Let's have a look at them. 
I'll take 10. I don't want to sort of blow up my REPL. I'll get rid of that now. So this is the sort of data that we're playing with. A date, to, from, subject, message ID. These are real emails that were sent by real people. Um, so I'd like to play with that data a little bit. I think I'd like to um, get the two from that. So I've got a whole array of names here, and I think I might take about 100 of them rather than 10. And I'd like to see, of those 100 mail, and they're in chronological order, um, who was sending that mail? So now I'm going to count of you know, the senders. Oh, that might be the recipients, actually. Um, and rather than 100, I'll actually just have a look at all of them now. And because they're not sorted, I'm going to sort by. I'm not really going to explain much of this to you because you're all terribly clever. And you can just play with this if you want to. All of these commands, uh, not this sort of playing with stuff, but the rest of it that I'm about to do, it's all in the readme for the GitHub project. So we can see um, that Tana and Mark, for the recipients, they received the most mail over a couple of years. They got about you know, six or 7,000 mail between them. If I want to look at who the mail was from, Chris. Chris is a big sender. And I can just reverse that if I want to, just to see who sent the fewest. Caroline, not a big um, producer of email at Enron. Um, and because I'm always uh, you know, interested in this sort of thing, I'm going to have a look and see. Um, how many derricks there were, because there are never any derricks. This is a little lambda that I'm putting in here. It's just saying, tell me whether first name equals Derek from the frequencies. Filter that out. Derek received five. No, sent five. Two. Sent 49 over a couple of years. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a taste of, because to be honest, you know, when I'm building streaming compute stuff for closure, it's just what I do. I write some tests. There's no object models. I'm not wondering what the correct way of, there's no getters and setters. I don't care. It's very unlikely I will ever care again unless I can't keep producing closure projects for myself and then I'll pretend to care. Um, but yes, yeah, it's got this real fungible thing, this malleability in closure that you can play with this data. You can build systems that do this, that process billions of events, um, and you can ship it in a jar into Kubernetes, get going, have a play with it. So that sort of demonstrates a little bit um, of that malleability of the data in the REPL. I'm going to skip back to actually the, uh, the project, Troy West slash DevOps18. I am going to have defined the messages. I'm going to require a namespace now. This is the system namespace. This is, follows a pattern that we use basically across all of our projects for closure. We've got one thing called system. It looks a bit like this. Uh, it's basically got some state. Um, and what we do is we have we define our system in configuration. We use a, a, a fine um, dependency injection and lifecycle framework in closure called Integrant, which I'd recommend everyone has a look at. Um, we define our system as um, data. It looks a bit like this. This is my configuration. I have, you might recall, that um, the system called Thimble is the thing that allows you to play with different servers and stuff. I've got a Thimble Zookeeper server that just uses default configuration. I've got a Kafka broker that requires the Zookeeper server and defines one topic called DevOps. I've got a Kafka producer that relies on the Kafka broker, and I'm going to use that in a minute to send my 100,000 messages to Kafka. Um, I've got a Cassandra cluster. That's going to be a three-node Cassandra cluster that's going to start outside of the JVM. On my machine, we, we use something called CCM, which is a Cassandra cluster manager. It's written in Python. We integrate with it with um, uh, Clojure's shell scripting extensions. You don't need to worry about any of that sort of stuff, really. It's just, it's just going to work. And then that's the sort of stuff, that's the state that would exist only in um, development configuration for one of the platforms that we're working on. I then define a cluster and a connection for connecting to Cassandra in a real world environment that would have details of servers and server names and ports and things to connect to. Um, and then at the bottom, I've got a stream. 
That is, uh, that is a Kafka Streams topology. It's got a little bit of configuration that says which topic to connect to. It gives it the Cassandra connection in the state. Oh, a little bit of stream configuration. It's all pretty straightforward. So um, I've got this uh, system. Did I just change that? No. I've got a system um, namespace. It's got a couple of methods. Initialize, and you can have a look at this after class if you want to. It just loads that configuration, uses integrant to raise all of that config up into state. Looks a little bit like I could type it myself, but I'm a bit lazy. Um, let's make this wrapper window a bit bigger. Looks a bit like this. So it takes about one swig of fizzy water to pretty much start everything. Um, I'm going to have uh, all of that state, if I use asterisk one, that's the last thing that was punted into the uh, REPL. That's going to tell me, oh, actually I'll just look at the keys of that. That's going to tell me I've got these things. And if I scroll up a little bit, let's just pick one, quick look at, there's the Zookeeper server, right? That original map has been transformed into a new map that's got some extra state and bits and pieces, and it's got a bunch of Java stuff, including a Zookeeper server. And the same for Kafka server startables, Kafka admin clients, producers, consumers. In here somewhere, I've got an entire connection to a Cassandra cluster. I've taken all of that domain that was quite difficult, stuck it in a thimble, and I start it in one JVM. This is how I work with these systems, right? Take all of that complexity, reduce as much of it as possible, get it to the point that I can have a play with it. I have four minutes left. so. Um, I've got a little namespace, which is a supporting namespace, just called Kafka. There's really not much in there at all, except a little utility function that's about sending a sequence, which I have, my messages, to uh, my th Kafka Thimble broker, which is a proper Kafka broker. There's nothing um, stubbed out or anything. It's exactly it's Kafka 1.00. It's exactly what you'd be using in production. When I send those messages to that Kafka um, uh, topic, my topology that I've created, this is a uh, Kafka stream right there. It's not much to it. It's about 10 lines of code. It doesn't do a lot. It's all Java interop. There's one for each action. For every single message that it receives on that topic, this streaming compute topology, which has been started, is waiting there in the REPL for any data. It's going to call this function with the Cassandra connection and the text, because my serializers and deserializers are just textual in this example. And all this function does is it logs every thousandth message that it receives. It transforms that message into a slightly different shape that is suitable for a read path in Cassandra, and um, it executes that, it writes it to Cassandra. That's all it does. So let's, um, let's use it. I'm gonna send uh, 100,000 messages to um, uh, to my Kafka topic, and there they are, they've been processed. Interesting thing about Kafka, um, order is only guaranteed within a partition. By default, we partition our topics by at least 100 partitions, because partitions are the fundamental unit of parallelism if you're computing over streams. Um, and so we get the sort of out of orderness of it, but it's chugging along. And it always seems to end on 99,000 for some reason. So it's quite reliable. So there you go, we've processed 100,000 messages. I can pop into um, a terminal. I can run um, CCM, Cassandra Cluster Manager, node one. Uh, let's uh, node tool. If anyone's ever used Cassandra, there is a single node Cassandra cluster running on my machine right now. Node one, CQLSH. Sorry, this is sort of like a uh, it's tiny, I know that. I'm just going to show you that I can select count star from um, subject, I think it's called. Uh, select. One second. Yep. So, um, 
I've written 389,952 indexes from my Kafka streams into, um, into that uh, table in Cassandra. And now, back here, I'm going to use my query. I've got 30 seconds left. I'm going to completely avoid answering any questions, which is wonderful. Um, and I'm going to execute a query that pulls back for one person on one day all of the subject, um, all the tokens in that subject that that person um, had in their email, their emails, you've got the message IDs and everything. And then similarly, I use um, Closure Core Async to fan out the parallelism. Closure's phenomenal for doing um, things in parallel. And I'm going to execute a query over time for about 700 requests against Cassandra, 25 requests at a time, um, pull it all back in, just like that. Those are all of the subject tokens for Mark for about a two-year period. So if you're interested in any of these systems whatsoever, my time is up, and um, I'm just going to shut down. So thanks very much, and I hope you enjoyed this talk. And uh, yeah, go, go bang on those rubber keys in the REPL and enjoy yourselves. <laughs>